Hello and welcome to this presentation. My name is Jacopo Bisagni. I'm a lecturer in classics at the National University of Ireland, Galway. My research usually focuses on texts and manuscripts from the early Middle Ages, so roughly before AD 1000. But today I'll be discussing and performing instrumental music from a late 13th century source uh, known as uh, Le Manuscrit du Roi or King's Manuscript. And I'll be playing the instruments that you see here in front of me, in particular a medieval recorder, an alto in G, made by Marie Ilsens, a medieval sopranino, made by Tim Cranmore, a double flute, made by Benjamin Simao, a traditional Corsican flute, made from a goat's horn, it's an instrument called Ivana, and this one was made by Romain Giannoni. And finally, a, a medieval set of bagpipes with one drone made by Corrado Perazzo. The tunes that I'm going to talk about, and which you're all about to hear, have been recorded many times, and indeed many of them are well known to people interested in medieval music. One of the most famous recordings is the one you see here on this slide, Estampi et Danse Royale, released in 2008 by Esperion 21, the ensemble led by the famous Jordi Savail. I want to begin my presentation precisely by quoting a passage from the sleeve notes of this album, where Savail presents his approach as to the performance of medieval music and this repertoire in particular. Any artistic approach to the performance of a musical source so ancient and, above all, so void of musical indications, since the manuscript bears no objective indication as to tempo, instruments, function, character, ornamentation, etc., poses considerable difficulties and challenges, which force us to make a number of highly personal and therefore necessarily subjective choices. Having said that, the personal and subjective nature of the process is not incompatible with the demands of a thorough and rigorously historical and organological approach to musicological research. This passage gives us a good idea of the fact that medieval music is truly quite special and almost unlike any other form of written music. Medieval music is not really just about learning how to play an instrument and then sit down in front uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the score of a medieval piece. Medieval music is rather a never-ending process involving many doubts and uncertainties, research, speculation and also a good deal of invention and improvisation. Indeed, when we deal with music written down in the Middle Ages there is an awful lot of things we do not know and we need to find our own answers to numerous questions. Question number one focuses on the musical source I wish to explore. What is the Manuscrit du Roi? First of all, this manuscript is now preserved at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. Although it is known as the King's Manuscript, simply because it ended up in the library of the kings of France, its official shelf mark is Paris BNF, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Francais 844. The earliest section of this manuscript was certainly written during the second half of the 13th century, probably between 1254 and the 1280s. We don't know for sure where it was written, but some evidence points to the region of Artois in the northernmost part of the Kingdom of France. The Manuscrit du Roi is also known as Chansonnier du Roi, or King's Songbook. This manuscript is primarily a songbook. It contains 428 Trouvères songs in Old French, as well as 61 Troubadour songs in Old Occitan. Many of these are provided with musical notation, as we can see on this particular folio. At the top we have an idealized depiction of the poet 
many of these authors were aristocrats and they are therefore represented uh, bearing arms. Immediately beneath the portrait of the poet we can see the first stanza with its music and then the other remaining stanzas. But so, if this is a songbook, why is there instrumental music in it at all? To understand this, one must first of all realize something important about medieval manuscripts in general. It's easy to think of a medieval manuscript as the equivalent of a modern printed book. In fact, there are very significant differences. We are used to modern printed books having great cohesion. Covers, title page, table of contents, the contents themselves, etc. We see these things as fixed and we expect different copies of the same book to be practically identical to one another. On the contrary, each medieval manuscript is a unique living object. No two manuscripts are exactly alike. Moreover, throughout its long life, a medieval manuscript typically goes through numerous transformations, with contents being added, removed and modified by subsequent generations of scribes and readers. And this is also the case for the Manuscrit du Roi, which had a very complex life. I mentioned earlier that the earliest section, the oldest section, dates from the second half of the 13th century. However, new fascicles were added to it at later stages. Many folios were savagely mutilated. As you can see, the portraits of some poets were removed, sometimes with loss of both music and text. Some other changes were a direct consequence of the manuscript's layout. As we've seen in the previous example, and as we can see here too, the scribes who wrote the Manuscrit du Roi often left large empty spaces in spite of the fact that parchment was fiercely expensive. It is therefore not too surprising that over the course of several decades, other scribes came along and decided to use some of those precious free spaces. In particular, one scribe decided to add 11 instrumental pieces. His intervention can be dated to circa AD 1300. Two of these pieces, a dance and a nameless tune, were added in the blank space of folio 5 recto. The remaining nine pieces, eight estampies and one royal dance, were added on the empty spaces of a sequence of folios beginning with folio 103 verso. Here we can see once again a violent mutilation in the upper half of the page, which unfortunately obliterated most of the first estampie. However, thankfully the other pieces have survived intact. Here are the end of the second and then the entire third and fourth estampie. And then here the fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth estampie, followed by the final piece, the Danse Réal, or Royal Dance. To give you an initial idea of what this music sounds like, I'll play the nameless tune that was added on folio 5 recto. I'm going to play this tune on my medieval recorder, uh, an alto in G, made by Marie Ulsens. <laughs> 
Now, the image you saw on the previous slide was the score, so to speak, of the nameless tune you've just heard. But how can we read these notes? In other words, how were these melodies notated? First of all, they were thankfully written in a notational system that we happen to know quite well. This is known as Franconian notation from the name of its inventor, a 13th century German music theorist who wrote an influential tract called Ars Cantus Mensurabilis, in which he proposed a system associating uh, specific shapes of notes to specific durations. Let's have a look at some of the uh, basics of this system. Here you can see the beginning of our nameless tune. If we compare this to a modern score, for example, the one for uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, there are some similarities. In both cases the notes are written on five lines, Moreover, the notes have different shapes for different durations. The modern score has a treble clef indicating the position of the note G on the second line from the bottom, while the medieval score has an initial symbol indicating the position of the note C, although unlike its modern counterpart, this sign does not have a fixed position. Other scores may have the note C placed further up or further down depending on how the melody moves. Another familiar feature is the sign in the purple rectangle that is meant to represent a letter B corresponding to the modern flat sign. So every note on that line must be flattened by a semitone. However, there are also several differences between the two systems. For example, in the medieval score there is no time signature and no subdivision into regular bars. And of course the shapes of the notes look pretty different too. Roughly, this is how the system works. There are three main shapes, longa, breve, and semi-breve. If we now assign a numerical value to each of them, the longa normally has value three, the breve one, and the semi-breve one half. If you're used to modern notation, you'll probably be surprised to see that the normal value of a longa is 3 and not 2. In fact, this relationship between longa and breve, 3 to 1, was known in the Middle Ages as perfectio, perfection, since it mirrored the very nature of God, whose holy trinity is at the same time 1 and 3. Okay, so far so good. However, things are unfortunately not always that simple, as these values can change according to a specific set of rules based on the context in which the notes occur. Let's see some examples. If we have two longae, one after the other, then there's no problem. It's just a sequence of two perfections, so three plus three. Things get more complicated if we find a longa followed by a breve. In this case, the perfection is constituted by the two notes taken together. Since a perfection must have a total value of 3, then in this context, the longa is shortened. Okay? It counts for 2 and the breve for 1. It's the sequence of the two notes together that gives us one perfection, 2 plus 1, 3. As you can see, this is precisely what we find at the beginning of our nameless tune from the Manuscrit du Roi, a perfection constituted by a longa plus a breve, 2 plus 1. Immediately afterwards comes another longa. So what is its value here, 3 or 2? Well. That depends, actually, on what comes next. Our longa is followed by a curious cluster of three notes. I've highlighted it in the green rectangle. This kind of cluster is known as a ligature. There were several conventional ligatures, and each of them expressed a conventional 
succession, a conventional sequence of durations or, if you like, of numerical values. For example, this one here must be read as a series of two semibreves followed by a longa. The one at, at the very top of the ligature it will be a longa. It's also important to realize that ligatures did not indicate notes that must be played together. So medieval ligatures do not correspond to a modern legato. They only express a conventional sequence of numerical values or values of duration. At this point, we just have to move on from note to note, from ligature to ligature, making sure that we always obtain a continuous sequence of perfections, each having value 3. So if we go back to the beginning of the medieval score for the nameless tune, here it goes. Uh, as we've seen, we begin with longa plus breve, 2 plus 1, and that's one perfection. Then we have a longa, and its value must be 2 because it's followed by the two semibreves in the ligature. The longa contained at the end of the ligature, so the third note of the ligature, must then have value 3, because it is followed by a perfection constituted by another longa plus a sign of pose, the little vertical line, having value 1. As you can see, all the notes contained in the big blue square finally add up to a series of four perfections. Thankfully, if you're interested in playing this music, there are aids out there. Not only manuals of medieval notation, but also good transcriptions, such as the ones in Timothy McGee's Medieval Instrumental Dances. Here, these melodies are transcribed in a modern notation, which is nonetheless respectful of several peculiar features of the original. So I'm now going to play another tune, the seventh Royal Estampi, and you can try and see if you can perhaps follow it on the score, knowing, however, that I will play the whole thing twice, and that as it is quite customary in the performance of medieval music, I shall take a few liberties with the original, especially introducing some ornamentation which is not written down. For this piece, I shall use a medieval sopranino made by uh, Tim Cranmore. I've just played the seventh estampi with a rather brisk, lively tempo, and you might legitimately ask why. How do we know the speed at which we should play these tunes? Well, to be perfectly honest, we don't know. 
the manuscript gives us no indication whatsoever. Modern scholars have elaborated some ingenious techniques for figuring out an approximate tempo for medieval pieces of music, but I must admit that I often find them difficult to apply in practice. Take for example this suggestion by Timothy McGee. Tempo must be determined by the flow of the structural rhythm of the melodic line. The basis of this method is the concept that the rhythm of most melodic lines can be analyzed simply in terms of the basic units of measure which pace the composition, and that by identifying these we will be able to choose the general tempo range. Mm. Okay, uh, I still don't really know how to do that. Uh, uh, and yet choosing a tempo does have significant implications for the general feel of a music piece, needless to say. To illustrate this point, I'll now play the sixth STMP in two very different ways. Once at a slow meditative pace and once much faster and with more regular tempo. The slow version will again be played on the sopranino, while for the fast version I'll be playing uh, the traditional Corsican flute called Pivana that you've seen uh, at the very beginning of the presentation, the one made with the goat's horn, uh, an instrument, as I said before, made by Romain Giannoni. It should be clear by now that while the manuscript does give us a very good idea of the shape of the melody and its metrical structure, there are also many things that the manuscript does not tell us. Hence the question, how much liberty can or should we take? In addition to having to decide the speed of a piece, a performer may want to supply other elements which, although not written down, we know to have been part of the normal performance practice of medieval musicians. I'm referring to things like ornamentation, improvised variations of the melodic lines and phrasing, and even the new composition of things like preludes and 
postludes? And perhaps the most extreme case of all, what should we do when a music piece is preserved only as an incomplete fragment? Should we only play strictly what has survived on the parchment, or should we compose new passages to fill the gaps? This is a very interesting and complex field, and I would encourage anyone who wishes to know more about this to read a recent book by Angela Mariani, Improvisation and Inventio in the Performance of Medieval Music which focuses precisely on those crucial pieces of information that medieval sources do not give us and which we therefore may have to supply in a way that should be at least as rational and as well informed as possible. In the Manuscrit du Roi, the first estampille is an excellent example. As you may remember, much of this piece has not survived because the top half of this folio was cut off. All that remains are the two final phrases of what was probably a much longer tune. So I'll now play this piece in two ways. First I'll only play what has survived. Afterwards I'll try to supply some of those things that were not written down as well as some newly composed musical phrases to fill the gaps. At this point, I should really discuss an even more fundamental question that modern musicians have to address before performing a piece of medieval music. Which instrument should one use? Once again, the manuscript itself does not give any indication in this respect. <laughs> 
Of course, the Middle Ages have left us thousands of images of musical instruments. You can see a tiny sample from various sources on this slide. However, iconography can be treacherous. The realism of medieval images is always open to question, because in most cases those images were simply not meant to be straightforward imitations or reproductions of the observed reality. A good example of this is the deep medieval interest in biblical instruments. The Bible offers a great wealth of terms for musical instruments. Here you can see Psalm 150 referring to trumpet, psalter, harp, timbrel, strings, organs and cymbals. Medieval interpreters of the Bible tried to uh, figure out what these instruments of the ancient Israelites might have been. And they also tried to extract an allegorical, spiritual meaning out of these mentions. This interest generated not only a number of texts dealing with this very topic, but also a rich and long-lasting uh, iconographical tradition representing more or less fictional musical instruments that had nothing to do with contemporary realities. Here you have a particularly early example, a Psalter written in northern France around the mid 9th century. But this tradition continued throughout the Middle Ages and beyond. For instance, we can still see these reinvented biblical instruments showing up in Pretorius's Syntagma Musicum, published in 1619. Thankfully, though, some sources are more informative on what the actual use of musical instruments may have been in France in the late 13th century. The most important text in this respect is undoubtedly the tract Ars Musicae, written by the Parisian scholar Johannes de Grocaio, or Jean de Grouchy, around 1275. In addition to treating numerous questions pertaining to music theory, Grocaio is best known for being the only medieval theorist who discussed instrumental music in detail, describing its forms, its functions, as well as the use of specific instruments. Grocaio is also the only theorist who wrote explicitly about the estampi, which he referred to uh, under its Latinized name Stantipes. Knowing his work is particularly important for a proper understanding of the instrumental pieces of the Manuscrit du Roi. Grocaio had no doubt. This is what he says. Amongst instruments, those with strings have primacy. Of this type are the psalterium, the chitarra, the lira, the chitarra saracenica, and the viella. Amongst all stringed instruments, the viella is seen to prevail. Although some instruments move the spirits of men more by their sound, such as the drum and trumpet in feasts, spear games and tournaments, in the viella, however, all musical forms are more subtly discerned. Hmm, it sounds like maybe I should have learned to, to play the viella to play these pieces, and the viella is basically uh, the medieval ancestor of the violin. Still, woodwind players like myself should not feel discouraged. After all, although Grocaio gave the crown to the viella, he certainly did not exclude the use of other instruments. Moreover, as far as flutes are concerned, we are at least comforted by the fact that some specimens of medieval recorders have been found by archaeologists, although none of these findings come from France, but rather from Central and Eastern Europe, they are nonetheless roughly from the right period. For example, the three recorders on this slide probably all date from the 14th century. Some evidence survives in the archaeological record also for bagpipes, and in this case we can also count on an immense iconographical repertoire, some of which is sufficiently informative to enable us to reconstruct hypothetical medieval bagpipes.
Of course, just like for tempo and other features I've been discussing, uh, the choice of the instrument can have a huge impact on how we perceive a musical piece. To demonstrate this, I'm now going to play the second estampi twice. The first time with the alto recorder in G, and the second time with a set of medieval bagpipes with one drone. This instrument was made uh, by Corrado Perazzo. I invite you especially to notice the great impact that the steady drone of the bagpipes has in our perception of the melody. Although the melody is the same, the presence of the drone modifies substantially the feelings we experience while listening. 
As we've just heard, even the simple addition of a drone can greatly modify our experience of a musical piece. At this point, then, another important question is whether this music was meant to be played solo or by a group of musicians. Once again, the manuscript offers no help whatsoever. As usual, medieval iconography is both informative and misleading. On the one hand, we do have depictions of musical ensembles. A particularly famous example is this fresco by Simone Martini, representing the investiture of St. Martin. Here, a group of musicians appears to be accompanying the ceremony. We see a player of double flute, a player of guitar, and two or possibly three singers. However, are these people actually playing together? In medieval iconography, the representation of individuals next to each other does not necessarily mean that those figures share the same space and time. Moreover, the fact that we, are, uh, we have here a wind instrument, a string instrument, and human voices is immediately suspect, as this is a traditional motif. Influential early medieval authors, such as Isidore of Seville, had categorized music precisely according to a threefold division between voice, wind, and finally the plucking of strings or the beating of percussions. For this reason, this kind of distribution is frequent in medieval images. Look at this depiction of the mythological sirens in an English bestiary from circa uh, 1200. Once again, we find voice, wind and strings. The musicians on the fresco by Simone Martini may then be far less realistic than they look. Rather than representing musicians making music together, that image may in fact be an allegory for the three categories that were believed to constitute music as a whole. That said, it still seems likely that musicians occasionally did play together, although probably not in large ensembles like the ones we're used to see in modern performances of medieval music. Solo performance was probably the norm, although performances as a duo or a trio could perhaps also take place on an occasional basis, particularly on special occasions and for the benefit of wealthy hosts who could afford to pay more than one musician. To give a sense for a slightly more polyphonic performance of a tune from the Manuscrit du Roi, I shall now play the famous fifth estampille on a double flute, a bit like the one we've just seen on, on the fresco, and this particular instrument was made by Benjamin Simao. Earlier on, I mentioned wealthy hosts. At this point, it seems inevitable to say something also about the audience for which this music was written. In this case, the answer is relatively straightforward. First of all, the manuscript itself is, as we've seen, an expensive object, an object of luxury. 
And of course, let us also remember that many of the authors of the songs contained in the uh, oldest section of the Manuscrit du Roi were nobles. That such a high social milieu also concerns our instrumental pieces is clearly indicated by Grocchio, who included the estampi and the ductia, that is, dance tunes, among the musical forms that commonly take place at feasts and games in the presence of the rich. Grocchio's words are confirmed by iconography, such as this representation of a banquet in the early 14th century Speculum Humanae Salvationis. Although even this image belongs to a biblical context, there are indications that this scene may be quite close to what a 14th century royal banquet looked like. The realistic depiction of the musical instruments is a particularly telltale element here. The very fact that the instrumental melodies of the Manuscrit du Roi were written down is enough to immediately associate them with the elite. Writing in general and writing music in particular was a specialized activity only practiced within the church or the upper classes. After all, we should not forget that almost all the titles of the instrumental pieces in this manuscript are accompanied by the adjective real, uh, royal. While this is not sufficient to argue that these pieces were actually composed for a king or perhaps for the French royal court, the association with the aristocracy is nevertheless unmistakable. So. With that image of a royal banquet now impressed in your mind, listen to the royal dance from the Manuscrit du Roi played on the sopranino. The tune you've just heard is explicitly said to be a dance in the manuscript. So we must now come to yet another question. Was the instrumental music of the Manuscrit du Roi composed for dancing? As far as the estampi is concerned, this is still controversial. But many scholars think that most of the available evidence indicates that the estampi was not dance music and I personally agree with that view. We'll come back to the estampi later. For the present, uh, present purpose, though, it's enough to say that two melodies in our manuscript are called dance. So at least for those two, uh, there seems to be no doubt. Now, how did people dance in the Middle Ages? Uh, well, we really do not know. The first dance treatises explaining how to dance, explaining the steps, were written in Italy around the middle of the 15th century, so at the very end of what we call the Middle Ages. Before that time, any reconstruction of medieval dances is necessarily speculative and heavily based on iconography. Unfortunately, as we have already seen repeatedly, medieval iconography can be difficult to interpret because usually based on traditions and conventions rather than real life. A typical example of this is the biblical motif of the dance of Salome. This motif is depicted many times and it's difficult to ascertain if the uh, positions and the steps visible in these representations has anything to do with contemporary realities. The purpose of these images 
was to give us the idea of dancing rather than provide us with precise information on how people really danced. Yet sometimes iconography does seem to be more informative. Here's an example. This is a famous early 14th century fresco by Ambrogio Lorenzetti, still visible in Siena and representing the effects of good government on the city. It's an allegorical scene which is meant to portray all the kinds of activities that should take place in an ideal late medieval city. We see both rich and poor people. We see merchants, shopkeepers, teachers, shepherds, peasants, builders, nobles, all living and working together harmoniously. At the center of the composition a dance, which art historians have explained as an allegory for social harmony, the symbol of a well-functioning society. But even if it is a symbol, an allegory, this dance scene also appears to be supremely realistic, from the detailed drum played by uh, the woman in, in the middle, in the very center, to the figures performed by the dancers, in this case, we see a figure still known as thread the needle in many forms in uh, traditional dancing, even forms of dancing still carried out today. Far from being systematically frowned upon, we do have evidence for positive attitudes towards dancing in the late Middle Ages. This image, for, for example, is taken from an Italian medical manuscript and it illustrates the benefits of dancing for a person's well-being. If we move to an image certainly coming from an ecclesiastical context, we can see that dancing was chosen here by this particular artist to represent one of the three types of music described by the late antique writer Boethius in his uh, very influential tract De Institutione Musica. At the top, Musica Mundana, that is the music of the cosmos, the music made by the movement of the heavenly bodies and the elements of nature. At the bottom, Musica Instrumentalis, the least noble kind of music, that is the music produced by human beings by singing and playing instruments, just a pale imitation of God's music. In the middle, musica humana, the inaudible music that is inherent in each human being and which consists in the harmony between body and soul in order to symbolize musica humana and its harmony. This artist chose to paint a dance. Returning to the secular context, the famous Codex Manesse a German manuscript from circa 1300 shows dancing as an essential component of aristocratic education. Here we can see a young girl being instructed by a lady, probably her mother, in the art of dancing, accompanied by Grocchio's favorite instrument, the viola. Grocchio, likewise, speaks in favor of dancing. He describes the ductia, dance music, as follows. A ductia is a non-lettered sound, measured with an appropriate beat. I say with a correct beat because the stresses measure both the music and the movements of the performer. And they, that is, the stresses, arouse the spirit of man to move decorously according to the art which they call dancing. Earlier on I played the royal dance, so it seems appropriate that I now play the other tune simply called Dance in the Manuscript du Roi, a tune that corresponds remarkably well to everything Roqueo tells us about the ductia. I'll play this tune on the bagpipes at three different speeds, all of which are theoretically possible. Mm. 
We've now arrived at a point of my presentation where it would be difficult not to address the question you see on the slide. So far I've played a few dance tunes, but mostly I've been playing Estampi. But what is an Estampi? This is actually a complex issue and a proper discussion would entail a lengthy examination of both musical and literary sources. Obviously we don't have time for that, so I'll only mention a couple of points. First of all, where does the word estampi come from? Rather than being related to the idea of stamping one's foot, French estampi probably derives from the Occitan name for this genre, estampido. In turn, estampido uh, probably comes from the Occitan verb estampir, meaning to resonate, to resound. The word could therefore refer precisely to a piece of music played on an instrument which the musician makes to resonate. If you think of it, such a meaning is quite similar to that of the word sonata, from Italian sonare, to play an instrument. More specifically, what is the structure of the French estampi in the Manuscrit du Roi? Regardless of their complexity and length, all estampi in our manuscript follow the same basic pattern. We begin with a short phrase, let's call it A. This phrase continues into a refrain which ends on a hanging note. This refrain, which I've labeled X, is fittingly called ouvert, open, in some of the scores on the manuscript. After we've played X, we go back to A and then proceed to the second refrain here indicated by the letter Y. This refrain comes to a proper conclusion, ending with a note that gives us a feeling of rest or closure. At that point, the piece moves on to a new phrase, B. After this, all we get in the manuscript is a Q, indicating that we must go back to refrain X, then play B again, and finally close this second section of the whole piece by playing refrain Y. And the same structure then repeats itself with the introduction of a phrase C, then D, etc. So to sum up, first of all A, X, then back to A, and then Y. And that concludes the first section of the piece. Then we play phrase B, then go back to the refrain X, then back to B, and then we conclude the second section of the piece with refrain Y, etc., uh, etc. Et A particularly clear example of this somewhat labyrinthine structure is the fourth estampi constituted by seven melodic phrases, each being followed by alternating open and closed refrains, X and Y. So here is the fourth estampi. <laughs> 
Estampi was indeed an instrumental piece, which however was not at all, or not primarily, meant for dancing. Then what was it for? What was its function? Of course, there is no particular problem in imagining that this kind of instrumental music may have been composed for listening. In fact, we do have some explicit confirmation of that and more. Grocchio does talk openly not only about the technical structure of the stantipes, the estampi, but also about its function, which goes well beyond that of mere entertainment. For Grocchio, the stantipes could have a striking spiritual effect on both the music and the audience. A stantipes is a non-lettered sound having a difficult distinction of concords determined through puncta. I say having a difficult etc since because of its difficulty it makes the spirit of the performer and also the spirit of the observer focus on it and often it diverts the minds of the rich from depraved thought. Animos divitum a prava cogitatione divertit. Well, why not try that now? Sit back, close your eyes, focus your mind on the meditative sound of the third royal estampi and let's see if Grocchio was right. After this little mental experiment, uh, we come to the final question and to the end of my presentation. After all these questions, it's almost inevitable to ask ourselves whether modern performances of medieval music are, in fact, accurate. As you've probably figured out by now, that depends heavily on what we mean by accurate. Not only will we never be able to verify if our reconstructions are correct, but also, as we've seen, we know for certain that we miss many crucial pieces of the puzzle. In this context, accurate cannot mean much more than uh, well-informed. 
in the performance of medieval music there can be no end to and no substitute for continuous research interpretation of difficult and often unclear sources as well as a certain degree of perfectly legitimate inventive creativity we've now come full circle and we shall finish where we began by reading once again the words of Jordi Savail words that I hope you'll now be able to understand much more deeply in the light of what you've heard and seen in this presentation any artistic approach to the performance of a musical source so ancient and above all so void of musical indications since the manuscript bears no objective indication as to tempo instruments function character ornamentation etc poses considerable difficulties and challenges which force us to make a number of highly personal and therefore necessarily subjective choices having said that the personal and subjective nature of the process is not incompatible with the demands of a thorough and rigorously historical and organological approach to musicological research. Of course, many other questions remain to be asked. For example, who were the musicians who played this music? And who composed it? And was the instrumental music in the Manuscrit du Roi conceived as uh, a single coherent program? Or were these isolated one-off pieces? Obviously, these questions would take us too far, and I shall leave them for some other occasion. At this point, only one tune remains to be played, the eighth estampite, with its complex and even surprising rhythm. I now invite you to listen to it with what I hope will be a new appreciation for sounds that resonate from a distance of 700 years. Thank you for listening.